Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. I'm Wayne Tuttle, your host, once again. Please hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, leave a comment if you choose to do so. The answer, we like your comments. Um, meanwhile, go to legendsuperstitionmountains.com. Check out everything we got there. Additional clips, the Barker Notes, and so forth, and so on, and merch. But, most importantly, October 25th, 26th, 27th. The Dutch Hunter Rendezvous. You'll find videos linking up to it and directions and everything else. Uh, bring some water. Um, there are restroom facilities, but there is no running water or electricity at the campsite. We'll get to kind of a little about the rendezvous and kind of touch upon a few things that kind of how things will be going here in the next couple of weeks. But let's get to today's story. Now, today's story. There, it seems to be there's a thing with guys named Bobby. Because I will tell the story and then make an explanation. Um, why I kind of was thinking about the story and then I was kind of confusing myself. Um, this is probably 83, 84. Kind of in that period where, again, I'm kind of transitioning out of like the guys I'd kind of known before. Kind of getting out there on my own. But it was still with some people familiar to me, and we'd met out there. I will leave one name out. There was myself and a friend of mine, Dave. And we rode out, and then there was another guy, and a guy named Bobby. And Bobby knew Dave and the other guy. I didn't know Bob. I, I knew who he was. Didn't really know him. So we drive out. We dropped a car down at Peralta and decided because we were going to shuttle. We were going to go in, down in, to buy Weaver's Needle. And... Uh, so we got it back up to first water and hiked in. We started going in, and this guy, Bobby, now he's probably 5'10", 5'11", probably a soft, if you understand what I mean, a soft 200 pounds or so. He had a pack. The pack had to be sticking up at least a foot over his head and almost down to his knees. He had so much stuff on him. It, it was amazing. It was like... And you could tell he was not balanced well. We're hiking in. The first thing I noticed is he always had something in his hand and was eating something. Um, if we stopped for a minute, he would have like little chocolate donuts. And he'd be walking along and he'd have a candy bar. And then you'd look over and he'd have some chips. And then you, we stopped at one point. I remember he sat down he pulled out a bag of chips and like an orange crush. It was just amazing amount of food he was pulling out of this pack. And I'm thinking, he's going to eat all his food and we're going to spend a couple days out there. He's going to run out of food. We continued to eat and eat and eat. He wasn't the best conversationalist. Um, I think we refer to those professionally, guys like him, as somewhat of a dumbass. And, uh, but, you know, he was friendly and nice enough guy. And he hadn't really been out there. And I don't know why someone thought it was a good idea to bring him. But because all the sugar, obviously, his energy is high, low, high, low, high, low. So we're, we're making our way in. And, and there was this odd, odd thing he had because the pack was so kind of like a weird ballast weight. He would trip. And, and when he would flip, fall, he would flip. And almost land on his feet and then fall over. And we'd have to get him up. First couple of times, this was pretty funny. Because it was like, woo boom. And it's like, and then he's like a turtle. He can't get up. So he's kind of rocking around in this big, huge pack. So we'd have to kind of stand him up, sit him up. He'd break out something, get some M&Ms out and start eating some M&Ms or something. And then he'd be back on his feet and we'd walk. But he did this at least... 10 or 12 times on the way to where we were camping. Um, which got kind of annoying after a bit because you'd watch him loop, boom, and then have to pick him up and then he'd have to rest for a minute. And you're just like, I don't, I, I don't know what the purpose of this is, why we brought him. So we get into camp and we're down near Pinion Camp area. There was an area where there was a little copse of trees. Thought we'd get a little shade there. It wasn't a distance from where we were heading. Now, there have been a couple guys I knew of 
that it had something to do with Weaver's Needle. This would be on the, the south side of Weaver's Needle, more of the Celeste Jones areas. We wanted to look around and check some of that stuff out. We'd been out there before, and we kind of like wanted to go check the area again. It's a pretty rough area. So we figured we'd split into groups, pairs, groups of two, and we'd search the area the next couple of days during the day. So um, we set up camp, get everything done. Um, of course, Bobby is useless because Bobby has been sugared out all day. So he's just literally like grab two pieces of firewood, drop it down, go sit down. Um, not much happening from him. We get to dinner. He's complaining. He doesn't feel really good. We're like, you really need to eat something normal and stuff. Um, we had the freeze-dried stuff and, you know, you add water and make your chili or your stew or whatever, spaghetti. He didn't want anything. Um, eventually, he decided to eat. He brought out, and he had a little can opener, but he brought out a thing of SpaghettiOs. He ate his little SpaghettiOs. Um, I don't know if he heated them up very well, but he ate his SpaghettiOs, went to lay down, um, we were talking by the campfire, kind of talking about the next day and stuff, because we're pretty excited, and it's really nice out. And then we realized he's just out, man. The guy's just like, he's kind of half on his side, almost laying down. He's just done. Oh, well, good for him. He'll sleep good. We'll get up in the morning, eat, and get going. Hopefully, he'll be better tomorrow. Sometime in the night, and I don't know, because I didn't have a watch or anything, but it's probably 1, 2, 3 in the morning. I wake up and I can't breathe. It's just like I'm trying to figure out is it raining? What what and it's stench and I just remember how bad it smelled and I was like, man, and it's just thick and I'm just like, what the hell? And I'm sitting up and I realize everybody's getting up and Bobby's just sitting there on his um sleeping bag. We're looking around. It turns out he decided he was too afraid to go off in the dark. He just had this little tiny flashlight thing. And so he decided to pee in the fire. And he just, I guess, let loose and put half, about half the fire off on the coals. And I don't know if anybody, but I don't know what was in his urine, probably all this sugar and crap. But it stunk and it was horrible. And so then we had to move everything after yelling at him, you don't do that. Move everything around the fire, got around kind of where we thought, the, hopefully the breeze, and we had to move out about five or 10 feet. And it's still, you could, oh, it was like miserable. So we lay back down, try to get ourselves some sleep. We get up in the morning, we're eating oatmeal, mixing up some oatmeal. And I did bring of anything heavier substance. I had a few apples and I think um, I brought some biscuits or rolls or something to eat for bread to kind of, something to stick to your gut. But um, for the most part, I was traveling pretty light. Bobby broke out a box of like pop tarts, like those marshmallow and fudge pop tarts or something, and he ate a whole box. And I was just like, "Whoa, this guy, man, this just nuts." And I'm I'm kind of amazed because I realize it's a lot in his pack. But what is he carrying in there after the food? He seemed to have some water, but it was just food like crazy. Oh, by the way, he also the sleeping bag he brought was this big, heavy, old, down sleeping bag that weighed probably 10 times as much as anyone else's sleeping bag. So that was his other problem. He was packed so inefficiently for the trip. But we get everything together. We go out. Um, Dave and I split off because I was not going to be stuck with Bobby. And we went out and we're traveling. We got out, and, and if you've ever been in that area, there's a lot of kind of ridges and stuff and a lot of workarounds and and we're out there kind of making our way um and then suddenly we started hearing screaming and yelling and we're like gosh crap something happened so dave and i start running back we get around over and we see the those two guys and bobby's standing there like this and it looks he looks weird and he's got his hands out and it looks like a scarecrow well, they'd come to a patch of teddy bear choyas, and they were going to go around it, and Bobby just decided it, he could just walk kind of through it. And somehow, he had picked up, outside of the, the soles of his feet and his face, 
He had teddy bear choyo stuck everywhere on him, the palms of his hands, the backs of his hands, his arms, his legs, his back, his front. He had just continually kept kicking them up, picking them up, and he looked like a giant living teddy bear choya. So we get over, and obviously he's in pain. So we all break out our knives. Um, someone had a comb, so we figure we'll get as much out as we could, and he can comb out some of the fine stuff. And we probably spent an hour or so just flicking these things off, I'm trying to be really careful. Got them kind of clear of it a little, and then just flicking them off and watching each other to make sure we don't flick them into each other. It took forever. Um, someone had a pair of tweezers, because you're out in the cactus country. And we had them kind of pull out, because they got those barbs. And a lot of them had stuck in them. So he was having a problem getting it out. And of course, you can imagine, he it's painful. And it's just everywhere. I mean, there was stuff in his butt. There was stuff in his crotch area. Back joints of his knees. Everywhere that would be painful. The palms of his hands, because he'd tried to brush them off. when it... <sighs> So... We decide that's it. We're kind of done. We need to get back to camp. Um, this probably ends the trip because there's just no way this guy is going to be where he can do anything. Um, we get back into camp. He gets his shirt off, cleans off his shirt. And then I think it was Dave went over and tweezered as much out of the upper body as he could. They would just kind of like, you know, till they Bobby would find one and then they'd pull one in the, and it hurts when you do that so we're sitting there by the fire um someone told him look you got to find something better to eat you need something solid in you you need to drink some water because this is gonna you know really mess with your system he's itching now so he's scratching um he looks like he has chicken pox because the red dots everywhere on him and he's gotten some in his face eventually from his hands trying to wipe his face and he has needles and just misery so he's sitting there totally miserable um we're miserable because he's just like almost whining crying the whole time and we know it's painful but it's also funny and it's also just kind of depressing because it just the trip's done so i can't remember who it is someone had something and said here try eating this this will get you a little more better energy and we ha we had coffee, make instant coffee. So we were like, drink some coffee, eat this, get in your system, and then here's some aspirins, and we'll keep pulling. Um, and he said, he like I said, he's just miserable. And then at one point, just before sunset, he stands up, and it's oh no, oh no, oh no, and he goes running off, and we're like, what? He comes back, and he's like, oh, I didn't make it, man. And all he turns around he had had diarrhea and he had just went in his pants and it's like the whole backside of his pants and everything are wet and we're like what the hell so then we're thinking well your shirt's clean of this the needles so get your get your spare set of clothes out we'll take some water wastewater we're leaving tomorrow anyways and you can wash up over here somewhere and get yourself cleaned up and then put your fresh set of clothes on because you can't be sitting around here like that man we could already you know he stunk um oh no i didn't bring any clothes i just brought food and stuff what are you talking about oh crap then we realized none of us had anything that he could wear um so he's gonna be stuck like that so we're like look you got it's like i'm not gonna give you my extra shirt to wipe your so, so it's like, oh man, what are we going to do? So we made him that night sleep on the other side of the fire. We built it up, made some green stuff on, made him stand in the smoke for a while to smoke him a little. And then told him, you just stay over there. You sure I'll be fine? Yeah, you'll be fine. Just stay over there. We'll sleep over here. And because you could, yeah, if he was within five feet of you, you were, you were like, oh man, it was just stomach turning. Um, he got in his sleeping bag that night, which was probably a mistake, but it was cool out. But uh, next morning we get up to leave. He's miserable. We're like, let's just pack everything up and just haul everything out of here. He eats more candy bars and junk food. 
we start heading out towards Peralta. What should have taken us maybe two hours to get out to Peralta, the trailhead, um, probably took us three or four. Uh, the only amusing thing on that whole part of the story is as we went down and did the switchbacks and stuff, we stayed way back, maybe 30 feet, 40 feet, and had Bobby out in front. And Bobby would still occasionally do his flips, and then we'd have to walk up, hold our breath, get him up, and then go, go, go. Um, it was watching the people coming up, because it's early in the day. They're coming up to go up to the saddle, to Fremont Saddle. And they would walk up and see him, and he's all spotty, remember, his arms and his face and everything. And then they would get next to him in the smell. And you would see their heads jerking and looking back. And then they would walk by us, like with big eyes, because he really smelled bad. Uh, we get down to the trailhead. Um, the guy that owned the car that was there <sighs> took every bit of water he had and just poured it on Bobby and said, Look, we got to rinse you off. Do something, man. That did not make things any better. Um, he had an old towel or something in the back. He put it in the back seat, told him to sit there. We'll drop these guys off and we're going to get you home. So we got in the car, miserable. Um, we put the windows down. AC back then wasn't great in cars, but we ran the air and the blower, and the vents, and the windows down, and smoked cigarettes, and all you could do is just retch and just kept oh, oh, the whole time to first water. Um, literally, they pulled into the first water parking lot area, just turned around, barely stopped. We got out, grabbed our gear, and he took off. Um, Dave and I were just like, oh my God, this is, how is he going to deal with that? Well, the, one of the reasons I don't use the other guy's name is because of this, is that uh, I guess they got a crest town. We got home. And I swear I could smell that odor a little after I got home. And after I took a shower, washed all my clothes, everything was fine. Well, I guess they were getting home, and they got into the West Valley, and there was a point where he couldn't take it. And he just pulled over and said, Bobby, get out. He pulled in like a U-Totem, Circle K, 7-Eleven. U-Totem was an old convenience store used to be around here. And uh, he just said, get out. And Bobby didn't want to get out. He's like, no, you got to get out, man. I can't take it. He said, literally, um, there's a pay phone. You can call someone to pick you up. I can't take it anymore. It was just, here's your stuff. He threw his stuff down over by the pay phone, I guess. And then he finally had to open the door, fight with him. And then he tried to drag Bobby out of the car. This ensued into a fight. Bobby was not a fighter. He was a big enough dude that he was able to resist quite a bit. But I guess in the course of events, and as you're trying to tell someone, just get out of my car and stuff, the other individual decided that he was just going to beat the shit out of Bobby. And he did. And um, the clerks at the store called the police. And I found this out several days later. But um, the cops showed up. And, of course, Bobby's there, and it's a mess. Bobby got the, his butt kicked severely, and, it, you know, it's hard to explain. He smells really bad. He wouldn't get out of my car. Um, that's not a legal way to be able to beat someone, I guess. So he ended up having to go to jail for the assault charges. They locked his car up for him. Um what I found out later was the car, because it sat there for several days and um, the windows were up and everything, the smell of Bobby permeated the car. Um, he got the car back. He kept trying to clean it. It would not clean. I know he finally cleaned it up best he could, threw whatever he could in there to create scents to cover it best he could. Rolled down the windows and traded it in for another car because he said he couldn't take it. It was just so residual. Um, I do know he spent a he had, I think he got probation for it, whatever. I don't know whatever came of that. But I don't want to use his name because it's kind of embarrassing. Guy could have kids and be fine. And to be honest, if I would have been stuck, I, I think I would have lost patience because there was a few times I thought, if he doesn't shut up, because he's one of those incessant talkers and just... Mm, 
driving you crazy talkers. I think between the whining, the talking, and everything carried on and everything happened, I probably would have punched him in the face a few times. But that's the story of Bobby. What's funny is, years later, or no, years before, there had been another guide we went into the same general area who did the flip over things. He would trip and fall over. Now, he didn't have as big of a pack, and he was younger. He was actually probably shorter but heavier, and his name was Bobby, too. So I don't know if the acrobatic skill of flipping over forward back on your feet is a Bobby thing. Nothing against Bobbies, but yeah, that was that was the story of that trip. Like I said, it has to be 83, 84. Kind of a funny one, but it taught me a lot of lessons about who you pick. But it also taught me lessons of why you bring spare socks and a spare, you know, even if it's just sweatpants. You bring something spare. You have something to wear. And after that, I did start for my spare set of clothes that I probably wasn't going to wear, bring a big pair of sweatpants because if someone else needed them, they could wear them. So I kind of started thinking in terms of like that. Um, but yeah, I'd never seen anybody eat that much fast food and garbage and candy in, in, a, in like a 24, 48 hour deal. Um, man, poor kid, man, who knows? He's probably a dad and everything's fine now. And he probably tries to pull that memory back. But yeah, that's the story of Bobby and the superstitions. So I hope you enjoyed that. A little fun. We're getting near to October and our October spooky stories and stuff and the rendezvous of course so i hope everybody enjoyed this hope everybody's having a great wonderful time hope everybody finishes out the rest of the week great sees us on live and then has a good weekend following all right so thanks for watching and remember the most important thing of all you know it i know it i'm wayne tuttle you're not and this was chasing legends